Hello. It's just one year since the U.S. signed a deal with the Taliban in Doha, Qatar. The deal meant to bring Taliban to peace negotiation table and end the United States' longest active war. The deal also committed the Taliban to stop attacks against U.S. and NATO forces. In return, U.S. agreed to withdraw its troops from Afghanistan by May 2021 and facilitate the release of more than 5,000 Taliban prisoners from Afghan government detention centers. In September 2020, Afghan government delegation and the Taliban kicked off the intra-Afghan talks in Doha. Hopes were high and some thought Afghanistan was finally on a track towards the lasting peace. Though a year on since the US-Taliban deal was signed, Afghanistan is witnessing a significant increase in violence. The country's um, rights activists, journalists, and influential figures were killed in deliberately and targeted attacks. A UN report two weeks ago stated that no fewer than 11 human rights defenders and media workers were killed from 12 September 2020, the start of peace negotiations through January 2013. 31-2021. Among the Milias Doi of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberties, Afghan service correspondent in Helmand province, Fatouma Khalil Jawed Folat in Abdul Samad Amiri of Afghanistan's Independence Human Rights Commission. The Taliban has denied involvement but has not publicly condemned the attack. The general perception is that the Taliban do benefit from the environment of fear and hopelessness around the peace process in the lack of critical voices demanding an inclusive peace, as Shahzad Akbar, chairperson of Afghanistan's Independent Human Rights Commission, writes in a recent Washington Post opinion piece. In today's discussion, I'm happy to say that um, we have Shahzad with us beside other members of the panel. Other members are Lord Tariq Ahmad of Wimbledon, United Kingdom's Minister for uh, State uh, Minister of State for South Asia and Commonwealth, Lutfullo Najafi Zada, head of Tulu News TV, Alia Eftekhar, coordinator and senior researcher, Asia Program Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, and Shabnam Nasimi, executive director of Conservative Friends for Afghanist of Afghanistan, which is a political, business, and diplomatic forum aimed at building a more meaningful and stronger relationship between the UK and Afghanistan. My name is Omid Marzban. I am a senior multimedia editor at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty's Afghan service. Radio Free Europe is a U.S. Congress-funded radio station that broadcasts to 23 countries and 27 languages, including Afghanistan. Let me mention that this webinar is jointly organized by Conservative Friends of Afghanistan, which works with British Parliament and the UK government to ensure Afghanistan's case is fairly heard in Parliament in Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. A warm welcome to all of you. Let's start with Lord Ahmed, who is going to be with us for the first half hour of this um, one hour long uh, webinar. I promise that the audience will get a chance to ask questions too. Please raise your hand and I will call your name. Lord Ahmed, welcome to the show. How do you observe the peace process in Doha? Well, first of all, good afternoon and assalamu alaikum to all your listeners. It's a real pleasure to join you um, in my capacity as Minister of State for South Asia, as you said in your introduction, and I pay tribute also to both the uh, Radio Liberty and to the Conservative Friends of Afghanistan. Uh, and it would be remiss of me not to uh, thank Shabnam in particular for her efforts uh, and in ensuring that I had um, the opportunity to join you today. As the minister uh, responsible for our relations with Afghanistan over a number of months, since I took on this role, indeed over a year now, I have been engaging quite directly with the senior leadership within the Afghanistan government, including President Ghani, Foreign Minister Hanif Asmar, amongst others, and regularly uh, been engaging on the issues of concern, which I'm sure we'll come on to talk about, but also right at the start of the process, when the peace uh, agreement and the talks were announced, I engaged directly in the talks in Afghanistan. And this two elements to this. One is, as you said, my role as South Asia Minister, but there's a wider issue here as well. I'm also the UK Minister for Human Rights. And when we look towards Afghanistan for its richness in terms of its people and its communities, I staunchly believe that the progressive and only road for Afghanistan as a country which is inclusive is to ensure that freedom of journalists, human rights, 
the, the progress we've seen on women's rights in particular, courageous women journalists, some who sadly have lost their lives, the opening space for civil society and indeed minorities is not just protected in this new vision for Afghanistan, but strengthened as well. And that's highlighting some of the key priorities that we as the UK government are focused in on. Again, of course, working very closely with our other allies and partners, most notably the United States, on ensuring that these peace uh, talks do actually end up in a place where we see those strengths and human rights being protected. It is vital to me that these are important issues and conditions which are set to ensure that inclusivity and opportunity for people in Afghanistan. Uh, the final point I'd just say in thanking you, Omid, just in terms of my opening remark, is it's tragic. And without doubt, that's the only word one can use that, notwithstanding the declarations that have been made for peace, it doesn't seem to be a week doesn't pass us by where tragically yet another innocent life is lost in Afghanistan. Or I should use the plural, even more tragically, lives. Because frankly speaking, some of the softer targets, if we could call them that, you know, civil society lead, you know, educational institutions, hospitals, all provide vulnerable targets for those who want to cause further division, not just distrust, but division and destruction. I'd go as far as saying that. So it's important that we come together, have a very candid exchange of views, but equally the, uh, remain very committed to that central and pivotal point, which is ensuring that the Afghanistan of the future is fully inclusive in terms of its rights for all communities and citizens. Thank you. Um, to, to guarantee that, there were many concerns that if the international troops withdraw from Afghanistan based on the U.S. Uh, uh, Taliban deal by May uh, this year, uh, the situation will worsen. So far, Germany announced to keep its troops in Afghanistan beyond May deadline of U.S. withdrawal, and NATO has said troops withdrawal will depend on the situation on the ground. What is the U.K. government's position on that? Well, I think it's an important point, and obviously we have a new administration now in the United States, which is looking at the situation in Afghanistan very clearly. We remain very much committed to our obligations to Afghanistan, particularly through our engagement through NATO. It's important that the NATO partners work together, because it's not about one or the other, it's about how we act in unison to ensure the long-term stability uh, of Afghanistan. And I totally understand the point that's been made and the concerns which have uh, been brought to the fore about uh, troop withdrawals. But nevertheless, it's an important consideration within the discussions which are taking place. But overall, I think our approach must be that the NATO allies must work uh, together in concert and ensuring that some of the, the key games that I've talked about, that those are reached in a matter which, again, prevent Afghanistan going into a backward trajectory. And I think that remains the primary objective. And if I may say, not just of our engagement through the support we've provided to the important issues of security in Afghanistan, but also the development support that we've provided, particularly which has seen a strengthening of rights, particularly of women, the investment we've made in education. However, I do fear, and I'm going to be very open with you, that um, that is uh, those gains are in danger of being lost um, and we need the, uh, the people, representatives of the Taliban, to really recognize the importance of this. And if I may, the other thing is this is often seen as a kind of religious issue, if I can go, you know, let's go back to those early days of Islam. Let's look at the fundamentals. You know, when the instruction was given in the Holy Quran to, of Iqra to recite, there wasn't a gender differential on that. Education wasn't made a differential. If we go back to the time of the Holy Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was the one who worked for his wife and then she was the one who proposed to him. And when we look at the early example of Hazrat Khadija, she was taken by the noble personality of the Prophet, who was much younger than her, in both employing her, him in the first instance and then marrying him and the proposal came from her. So these notions of somehow women not being empowered and there's some Islamic basis or ideology needs to be dismissed from the outset. And those who present such a perverse picture should be challenged quite directly from those early traditions and examples. And I think that conversation needs to be had. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. We will surely come back to you, Lord Ahmed. We'll have lots of questions to talk to to talk about and to raise. Um, let's go to Lutfullah. Lutfullah Najaf is the head of Tolo uh, News. I'm glad to um, have him here. Um, Lutfullah, you have been in very close contact with the Afghan government uh, peace delegation and the Taliban negotiators. You have traveled to Doha. Um, uh, where um, you met uh, negotiating members of both uh, delegations. Um, where do you think the peace talks are heading? Are you still as optimistic about the peace talks as you were two years ago when we met in Kabul? Thank you, Omid. And thanks to the organizers uh, for, for this uh, uh, for this session. Good to see you all. We always say um, that uh, at the beginning of each year in the past two decades or so that this year is crucial or this year is the most crucial. Um, and then we keep saying that uh, at the beginning of each year. But I think that applies to a great extent to 2021 uh, when it comes to the peace process. Uh, some people call it really a year of uh, make or break. I believe we have never come this close to, to peace, uh, but it gets trickier, more difficult, more challenging as we move forward. Uh, such a moment um, of toughness, uh, of challenging time was inevitable whenever we decided uh, to take this route or we peace with the Taliban. Uh, there has been an increase in civilian casualties and targeted killings, but these killings are not just targeted at human lives but Afghanistan's future, Afghanistan's promising future, Afghanistan's values, democratic values, true Islamic values, Afghanistan's rich culture of tolerance, cohabitation and harmony. So, so it's really, I think the scope of these attacks are really, really wide. Attacking journalists and independent voices, I believe is part of that campaign of fear. And it's directly linked to uh, the peace process omit. We've said it before to all parties, you mentioned our trip to Doha, to the Taliban as well, to the government, to the international communities, to, um, uh, to, to in independent voices in the country uh, as well, and other forces within uh, Afghanistan and outside. In previous peace efforts throughout Afghanistan's 40 years of conflict, I think none was debated and scrutinized as much as this one, the current one, thanks to free press. Uh, and the constitution the space uh, of, um, uh, which is given uh, to Afghanistan in the past two decades for free speech. Doha process uh, was reported blow by blow uh, as one negotiator once told me to the Afghan people. Uh, that was unprecedented. Such reporting, I believe, has definitely enabled the Afghan public to raise serious questions about the process and ask for clarity. Previous uh, peace efforts from Peshawar to the holy city of Mecca, from Geneva to Ashgabat, from you know, to Mashhad, I think all primarily failed because the outcomes and agreements were not tested through public debates before those agreements were reached. So, as you mentioned, along with my colleagues, uh, you know, we did um, uh, we did go to Doha late last year and met with the Taliban leadership and asked for transparency in the process. And our and our argument was that it's crucial for the peace process and it benefits all of us. So it's not just benefiting us in terms of produ producing news, but it benefits the, the process. It benefits them, the Taliban, because they have been away from uh, Afghan realities and, and Afghanistan for a very long time. But attacking journalists is not just because they're doing their job by reporting. Uh, they also represent new Afghanistan, the Afghanistan, which is which its dominant majority. I mean, we, we all know uh, two thirds of the country under 25, the youth, they know nothing of a civic space where speaking your mind, mind can be prohibited, can be punished. So I think we all talk about the price of peace and the recent losses are, I think, are part of that. Uh, I'm not pessimistic. Uh, killing individuals are painful. We have experienced it very closely. Uh, Ms. Akbar has lost colleagues. I have lost colleagues. Um, uh, these are very, very painful. 
But it does not mean that killing individuals will ultimately kill the cause. I think the cause is much larger than numbers, particularly when it comes to Afghanistan of today. I end with one short message as, um, as, as, as my introductory remarks, and then we get into uh, um, uh, questions if there were any. The formula for peace should be one based on values. If we are going to secure a lasting peace in Afghanistan, I think that's a much bigger common denominator for all Afghans. So I hope, I hope that is, um, that is uh, what is going to be embraced by all parties, including the US, the Afghan government and the Taliban. Any other formulas that we have uh, experienced in the past uh, uh, 40, 14 years, I would say, you know, have uh, failed miserably. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ilifola. Just um, one question I raised first, like how do you think, where do you think these peace talks are going? Are you still optimistic about the results? Are we gonna, do you think we're gonna get a result soon? I think, the well, the U.S. Uh, chief negotiator is in, in town right now, uh, and he has been discussing with the Afghan leadership uh, uh, before heading to Doha about the process. I believe um, uh, now is the time to address some of the very critical questions about the peace process um, when it comes to to the price of that. As, as, as I mentioned earlier, I think uh, we also need to discuss whether, um, you know, what formula we have on the table and why we should be optimistic about it. I'm personally very happy that peace is a very top priority for all of us. I think that, I think, I think that's quite positive. But um, details matter, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, the future of Afghanistan. So um, uh, I, I would say, I would say the next, uh, the next few weeks are very, very crucial. So um, maybe we should have another session in a few weeks time. Thank you, uh, Lutfullah. We surely will have to um, plan it. It's important, as you said, the top priority of all Afghans at the moment is peace. That's the discussion in every street, every uh, gathering and every meeting. Um, Shahzad Akbar, uh, the chairperson of um, uh, Afghanistan Independent Human Rights, um, commission um, is is with us, uh, Sharzad. I, I read the, your piece, your opinion piece on Washington Post, which is arguably uh, the most influential newspaper among policymakers in Washington. You have stated that uh, the U.S. Taliban deal has ignored protection of civilians, and you have asked uh, the Biden administration to reconsider um, urgently. What else do you think is missing in the deal? Thank you, Major, and uh, greetings to everyone. I'm truly be honored uh, to be speaking uh, with these co-panelists and to this group. Um, um, in terms of the US um, Taliban deal, unfortunately, some of the worst fears that Afghans had came true. Um, the, some of the worst uh, fears that we had around this time last year was exactly around these questions. What does reduction of violence exactly mean? Why is it not in the text of the deal clearly that, was, that has been released to the public? Who is going to monitor this? Who is going to verify if the commitments have been made? And where is, the, uh, where is the protection of Afghan lives in this deal, and particularly protection of civilians in the civic space? Um, so I think these questions um, do need to be considered as we move forward, um, exactly because of uh, the reasons that uh, Lotfala also raised. Um, the attacks, the targeted attacks, um, which no one is claiming or mostly unclaimed, uh, have taken the lives of 11 journalists um, in 2020, according to our figures, and 17 journalists have been injured. It has meant that a lot of people are now self-censoring. Um, when, when I was speaking to journalists in December, late December, they told me, I spoke to more than 100 journalists across Afghanistan, and they told me, we are not as outspoken as we were before. We are worried about publishing our reports we were worried about doing reports, investigating issues, because we are scared. So the, this was something that protecting the civic space and why it's important for the peace process. This was something that really there was very, I think there was no thinking about. Also in the US-Taliban deal, as you know, there is no reference to human rights. Whenever we raised with these issues uh, with, um, 
with the um, chief negotiator, Mr. Khalil Zod, and his team, there was a lot of discussion about the fact that this is a US Taliban deal. And so all issues pertaining to Afghans should be then dealt with later by the two Afghan negotiating teams who sit across from each other in the table. But we were, again, also reassured continuously that there will be a substantive reduction in violence that would supposedly create this environment where public engagement in the peace process would be possible. That wasn't, that didn't happen. And if we are correcting course, that should be one of the key issues because for the past few years in Afghanistan, because of the violence, we haven't had big gatherings. We haven't get, had large, it has been very difficult. People have had to really basically risk their lives to organize a demonstration. And if you want to talk about a peace process that's lasting, you need to have the voice of people. If journalists and human rights defenders are also being targeted and silenced, you basically have a discussion just between the two parties and it will be a merely political discussion. There won't be any space to discuss human rights issues, rights of victims, which is a key issue for justice in Afghanistan and for the, for the stability of the peace process, for the continuity of the peace um, deal. All of these issues will be sidelined. So I think now, looking back, looking at the lessons that we have learned, it's very important for all of us, for the Afghan public, also for the Taliban and for the Afghan negotiating team and the Americans as the key actor to take these lessons into account and move forward in a way that really contributes to a lasting peace in Afghanistan. Um, very shortly, um, um, Shahzad, you said um, about uh, Mr. Khalilzad being in town. Uh, Lothullah mentioned that as well. Are you going to have a chance to meet him this time and tell him um, about your concerns, concerns about the deal he signed with the Taliban? Absolutely. My colleagues are actually meeting him tomorrow. I have another engagement on victims' rights. But yes, we have regularly communicated uh, with uh, with colleagues in the embassy as well and with US policymakers, our concerns, one of the aspects of the deal that had a very important human rights uh, aspect was the uh, prisoner release or prisoner exchange. Um, we are again concerned about the implications of the previous prisoner exchange and the lessons learned and the implications for victims' rights and human rights if that discussion comes to the table again. So we are closely watching the process. We have very specific advocacy on protection of civilians, on importance of ceasefire, and on human rights and protection of civic space, including media and journalists. I want to also quickly add that when I talk about protection of civic space, there is also a duty for the Afghan government. We are also, we need to keep reminding the Afghan government to improve its ability to prevent attacks, to improve security for citizens at large, but also particularly for civilians, to also to continue to improve the enabling environment for journalists to do their work. Use of any language, intimidating language or calling, calling investigations or news, um, you know, by independent media biased or calling investigations fake news, none of this really helps. So Thank you. there is a huge burden on the Afghan government to do better as well. Thank you very much, uh, Shahzad. We surely will come back to you and we'll discuss it further, how the Afghan government play a role in this uh, situation and what has it done or not. Um, let's go to Alia Iftikhar, coordinator and senior researcher at Asia Program Committee to Protect Journalists. Uh, the first question, Alia, to you would be um, this, reg re regarding the Afghan government, basically, CPJ has been critical of the Afghan government uh, for not punishing those responsible for the killing of many journalists. Have you been able to advocate for protection of journalists in an international level? Um, well, first of all, thank you to uh, the organizers and all my fellow panelists. And uh, yes, you're absolutely right. We have, like Shahrzad just said, you know, there is a responsibility for the Afghan government to be doing everything within their power to make sure that journalists and other civil society actors are able to do their work safely. Um, and then part of what Committee to Protect Journalists does is advocate for press freedom around the world. And in every situation, you know, every country is dealing with different challenges, so that will look different. Um, but one of our primary focuses around the world and in Afghanistan right now is trying to ensure the safety of journalists. Unfortunately, in the past year, obviously, we've seen a massive failing. Um, it's been a failure on numerous accounts in that we have seen so many lives lost. And we, Afghanistan, 
Afghanistan has consistently um, been ranked among the countries that uh, on CPJ's impunity index, which means it's a place where journalists are killed and their killers go without facing consequences, which naturally is going to continue a cycle of violence and an environment of fear. On top of that, 2020 was one of the deadliest years that we have seen for journalists in Afghanistan. And this is all happening, you know, as many of the my fellow panelists have said, it during a time of peace talks and peace negotiations. And um, from my view, I think it is extremely important that the rights of journalists, their abilities to do their jobs, their abilities to report on this these peace process and the peace negotiations. Um, are maintained and that the safety of journalists uh, continues to be a priority for everyone involved because I think as everyone has said it is extremely important for the future of Afghanistan as well as you know protecting many of the gains that have been made in recent years. Thank you very much Alia we will come back to you I wish we had somebody from the Afghan government who could answer some of the questions that will be raised here. Um, but we'll, let's go to Shabnam Nasimi, Executive Director of Conservative Friends of Afghanistan, which is a political business and diplomatic forum uh, aimed at building more meaningful and stronger relationship between the UK and Afghanistan. Uh, and Shabnam, you have been, uh, your, your forum, your organization has been pretty um, active and you yourself have been a very loud voice um, um, in, in recent uh, days and months uh, about uh, freedom of speech in Afghanistan. Could you tell us what have you done recently, how, how effective your um, efforts have uh, been? Can you hear us, Shabnam? I'm on mute. There we go. That's better. Thank you, Amid. Um, well, I'd like to start by uh, paying my deepest condolences to the brave journalists and reporters who have lost their lives recently standing up for the free freedom of speech. Um, you know, these in intentional, premeditated and deliberate attacks on the media have come at a time when dialogue is needed more than ever before to end 42 years of war, uh, prompting Afghanistan's fantastic professionals to quit their jobs, leave their homes or exercise self-censorship. And this uh, trend uh, combined with the absence of investigation or accountability has generated a climate of fear among the population. Um, the killings have had a broader impact across uh, society in Afghanistan have also diminishing expectations uh, and efforts towards peace. Um, and so one of the key aims of the Conservative Friends of Afghanistan and groups outside of Afghanistan um, is to work with our friends, our allies, and in this case, specifically the UK, uh, to ensure that um, Afghanistan is not left behind. Um, you know, 42 years of war, 20 years of, of international presence, live lost, sacrifices made, uh, billions in aid, uh, all of that can go... Um, um, could vanish within a second if Afghanistan is left alone to fight this battle um, after you know 20 years of, of international presence. So some of our key priorities and work is to ensure that despite the UK um, Br uh, British um, troop withdrawal in 2014 and very little um, being th that's heard of Afghanistan outside uh, the country and the media, our work is to, to bring it back into the agenda, to raise awareness of some of the key challenges that continue to exist, to ensure that the world understands can hear Afghans um, and know that uh, despite, even though we're not hearing about it or the country does not mean that the war has ended. The war continues to persist. Uh, a peace deal does not mean the war has ended. Neither does an agreement with the Taliban. We need to ensure that any sort of political settlement that does that that, that is agreed upon in Doha, if that, that does happen, um, is based on what Afghans uh, want, uh, the kind of future they want for the country. Unfortunately, hope has been lost 
for a while no, now. Um, and I think it's a priority for, for people like myself who, who live outside of the country to ensure that we continuously advocate um, and raise awareness um, so that we don't, Afghanistan is not, um, does not turn back to 2001, prior to 2001 and, to, and, and into a safe haven for terrorism. Uh, thank you, Shemnam. I see some um, questions raised by the audience. Um, I suggest uh, if you could kindly um, check them out and, and raise it uh, with our panelists, especially if you could uh, uh, raise the first question that is for um, Lord Ahmed, because uh, I suggest he, I, I, I expect he is going to leave us soon. So let's ask him the first questions and then we will continue with the panelists. Yes, well, one I think one question that's come to light here is by um... Uh, a gentleman called Rafi Ekhlil, who's asking um, Lord Ahmad um, on the work that the UK government is doing on women's rights issues um, and how, um, how the UK plans to support women's involvement in the peace process. Well, thank you very much. It's a very absorbing, and no, no, I've just, uh, on a slightly lighter note, just said to me, I, Private Secretary, I will certainly stay for this question and uh, I look forward to further engagement uh, on this important issue. But that's a very pertinent issue, as you'll be aware, at the pledging conference, we again reiterated our support for various programs in terms of women's rights specifically. It must start with a priority which has been reflected by our Prime Minister's priority on girls' education, 12 years of quality education in respect of where that girl may be. Indeed, um, the Prime Minister recently spoke to the President of Afghanistan and amongst the various issues they talked about, of course, the peace talks was our continued commitment on ensuring the empowerment and rights of women. In this respect, it is a still a very sad uh, picture we draw as I was listening to my fellow panelists, uh, uh, Alia and Shahrazad in particular. Um, you know, one reflects on the journalists that have been killed and we were looking at some statistics, you know, that since the start of the peace talks, um, the number of journalists and human rights defenders that have been killed, and most recently, those who uphold the law. In particular, I remember talking to the Foreign Minister of Afghanistan on the uh, sad and tr killing and, and the sad situation that the family, the country, and the rule of law faces when two women, Adria Yassini and Zakia Arabi, two female judges, were directly targeted. Um, uh, you know, judges of the Supreme Court, and that was in only in January this year. So I think the work is very much cut out for everyone. Um, and as I said in my opening remarks, whilst we have supported, and I'm proud of the work we've done in supporting women journalists, supporting human rights defenders and women civil society groups, we've set up a specific uh, forum within the uh, UN in New York, which includes the excellent ambassador of Afghanistan herself, a woman. Um, that leads on this particular agenda. But it comes back to a point which has been made. Um, since September, five human rights defenders, six media professionals have been killed. And that's just the timeline since these talks really began. And whilst we are encouraged that sides have continued to commit to the peace talks, we'll remain very much focused. And if I may, a, a personal perspective on this, and I feel very strongly about this, it cannot be right coming back to the point on peace negotiations, that women are in any way excluded. I've always taken a very dim view on those who suggest that oh, we've consulted the women or we're giving women a voice. They have a voice. They don't need to be consulted. They should be in the room. They should be pivotal towards peace building and then sustaining peace for the longer term. The exclusion of women will mean that peace deal will not last. And when people say, how do you know? Well, the evidence points in that direction. So I assure you that'll be something that I'll be raising consistently through my contributions at government to government level, but also we look forward to continue to support these incredibly courageous women's human rights defenders, whether journalists or in other fields of civil society to ensure their voice is not just her, but their part of building that new Afghanistan. May I just, once again, uh, I'm, my apologies, I have to, leave because of the challenges of schedule, but um, I really have welcomed this opportunity. In particular, uh, I pay tribute to my fellow panelists. Your insightful remarks have been both uh, educational for me, but also inform informing some of my thoughts as we look to support the government of Afghanistan 
on this important but remaining a challenging journey as well. I am really grateful for allowing me to participate today. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, Chairman, since we have uh, more questions from the audience, if we raise those questions, we will continue with um, other panelists and questions. Yes, so, um, you know, probably this could be directed at um, Shahzad, um, Shahzad John. The, you know, people in Afghanistan, this is, this is a specific question from USIP, um, Ehsan Zia, who's saying that people are worried that there'll be a repetition of history with a hasty troop withdrawal um, and a rushed peace agreement. Um, is there, in your opinion, any interest from the US or the UK or the uh, sort of international supporters of Afghanistan to let peace negotiations um, progress naturally, um, as has been the case in other countries engaged in civil war? Um, or is a hasty withdrawal, troop withdrawal still, still the plan? Um, thank you, Shabnam Jan. I think the initial conditions for the withdrawal, um, of course, included um, ceasefire um, as well as uh, a, a, an agreement on a political roadmap. Um, and the reason these were set as conditions was exactly these concerns um, that there would be um, that there would be a withdrawal in the absence of any progress in in the peace talks. Um, so the conditions were interlinked and our understanding initially was that uh, basically an agreement on one of them um, will require an agreement um, on, on all other aspects of, of the US Taliban deal. Um, I understand that there is a lot of anxiety about, um, you know, about um, troop withdrawal and the implications on the ground. Um, Peace negotiations will not be easy. I think we all need to think about what's the minimum acceptable conditions on the ground um, to give assurance to the Afghan public mainly uh, that the process would not collapse and that um, the two sides would continue to commit to, um, to substantive discussions to try to resolve differences rather than attempt victory on the battlefield. Uh, there is a sense that Taliban have more or less concluded or had so far concluded that they are victor victorious and that is not genuinely interested in, in, in kind of pushing the discussion forward and engaging in substantive discussions about difficult issues about the political system, future of constitution, you know, um, state society relations, all those issues where there are differences like really huge uh, difference of opinion between the two sides. I think what can help also with bringing energy to the talks and really um, ensuring to, to a great extent that, um, that the parties commit is to couple the international pressure with uh, local pressure, with the pressure from the Afghan public. And that's only possible if the Afghans have a, some space to breathe. Whenever, wherever we talk to tribal elders, to uh, civil society activists, to journalists across Afghanistan, their demands from the both sides is very clear. They are asking for ceasefire and they are asking for a political solution to the conflict. They are asking both sides to put political interests aside and, and agree on a giant roadmap and listen to the voice of the people. But this voice is not being reflected as strongly as it should because there is no space for people to express this voice without risking their lives really. So I think it's important to, as we move forward, to really continue to build that civic space and that public space to couple international engagement with uh, local pressure as well as better regional engagement if we do want to see something, if we do want to see a meaningful peace process, not just a delaying tactic. Thank you very much, uh, Sharzad. Um, do we have more? Um, I suggest, I suppose we have more questions, Shabnam, right? We, we do. There are quite a few others. Well, I think this one specifically yes. would be great for Lutfullah if, if he has a moment. Um, we'll yeah. do one, one more question and then we will go for, we'll have like about 15 minutes or less to, to conclude. 
Sure. Um, the question is specifically on what can be done to strengthen the provincial and rural media, print, radio, TV, or web. I think the impression outside of Afghanistan is all media is Kabul based. Um, what, what can be done to protect and support media outside of the city? I think media in rural Afghanistan, or at least at a provincial level, are quite strong. We had a, a session yesterday with uh, uh, ambassadors in Kabul, where we had very powerful voices from uh, all four main regions of Afghanistan connected, heads of uh, even journalists, you know, were expressing their views uh, about the peace process. Um, also in terms of, uh, you know, local news, if you say, although Afghanistan is, um, uh, everything is so centralized, including um, uh, news consumption, uh, because there is a lot of interest in Kabul, but uh, we do have very strong uh, uh, TV channels uh, as well as print in cities like Herat, uh, Kandahar, for instance, uh, as well as Mazar Sharif. Um, in um, uh, some other places, we might have difficulties, of course. Um, I think um, if to, re to rephrase the question, uh, maybe after the uh, uh, attack uh, in Helmand on uh, radio, so these journalists. Uh, many journalists left the province, uh, including including our our colleague uh, who is in Kabul right now, uh, and there was this vacuum. Um, so how can we protect uh, that space down there in Kandahar and Helmand? Is of course to provide security, uh, is is to make sure that journalists feel safe when um, to to an understandable degree uh, to conduct uh, their, their daily life and their daily work. Um, I think uh, pro probably that's what's needed the most right now. And do you so think the Afghan and do you think the Afghan government can provide that, or do we do, can we ask the international community to pay more attention towards media protection? I mean, what is your view on this? No, I think it's, um, it's the responsibility of Afghans first, uh, of course, supported by the international community. Uh, I don't think the international community can do everything for us, and we shouldn't ask them, you know, to do everything for us. Um, I think the Afghan government uh, is, of course, lagging behind when it comes to uh, providing security for journalists. Um, uh, it's not just journalists, I have to say. Um, your, the other panelists mentioned about judges, doctors, engineers, uh, ordinary Afghans. Uh, it's, it's just, it's just uh, a widespread uh, campaign of uh, intimidation and fear and killing, uh, which is targeted at whatever which promises a better future. So how can we protect that? I think it's twofold. One is uh, the political side. On the political side, that's where the international community can also um, chip in. That is by uh, putting more pressure on, on um, domestic and international and regional stakeholders. And then that, uh, there is a technical side of it where the Afghan government should do more and can do more, um, uh, as, well as, as well as I think other actors within the country. Uh, so. Um, I think uh, coming back to the question of uh, media, uh, the media is quite strong. Um, uh, we still, um, given given the amount of the amount of challenges, uh, um, uh, I, I see no uh, radio station or TV channel or print who have shut down their operation uh, due to threats. Of course, some journalists have left. Of course, you know there might be self censorship. Um, I'm, I'm not going to rule that out, but um, uh, they have not been able to shut down the space of, of, of free reporting. Um, and I believe that's thanks to the strength of the, um, uh, of the sector, uh, which has come a long way in the past two decades. And I believe uh, it will remain strong and uh, not just to report, but be part of uh, the larger peace process. Uh, thank you very much, Elud Fala. Um, uh, I probably would like to raise the same question to Alia Eftihar, coordinator and serial researcher at uh, Asia Program Committee to Protect Journalists. Uh, I, uh, Alia, I know that uh, uh, CPJ has helped uh, and to relocate some of actually some of uh, journalists in danger from different parts of Afghanistan. Um, do you think that is the way that that is that's? Do you think that's that's? enough or what else can we do to protect journalists, especially in rural areas? I mean, obviously Kabul is not safe either, but uh, in the rural areas, they are even more, more uh, vulnerable. So we do provide assistance, but the Committee to Protect Journalists goal 
is and always will be for journalists to be able to report safely from their home countries. So while we may at times because of very serious or grave uh, physical risks temporarily relocate a journalist, um, our goal is always that it is temporary. Um, and I mean, it's, it's not feasible. We cannot, you know, every time there's a crisis, every time there's a war, we cannot remove physically uh, every journalist that's working and then hope that they'll return. Because for one, we need journalists on the ground to be able to record and document what is going on. Um, so I think like Lothfala just said, Afghan media is extremely robust. Um, we have seen TV channels, radio stations, print newspapers in every province and so many cities across Afghanistan. The priority right now should be preventing that vacuum where so many journalists at this moment are feeling so unsafe that they have either left those cities to seek better safety in Kabul or maybe abroad. And that is, you know, leaving a vacuum where we don't have the same level of information that we should uh, from those areas. And we can't blame them, right? No, every journalist, so many civil society actors, so many human rights activists, everyone in Afghanistan right now is feeling unsafe. And part of that is because of who we have seen being targeted. Uh, the number of journalists we have lost in recent months, they are not all in Kabul. In fact, they are in numerous different cities, numerous provinces across the country. And they are journalists who have worked in radio as photojournalists. Um, they are men, they are women. There's no one set of journalists that has been targeted. And of course, that's going to add to an environment of fear. Of course, every journalist is going to feel unsafe because they are seeing that there's not really any discrimination in terms of who is being targeted right now. It is anybody who is daring to continue to do their work and put everything on the record. And unfortunately, I think, like Lothfala uh, kind of identified, our priority right now should be to ensure in whatever ways that we can that journalists can stay in Afghanistan and do their jobs from where they are from. Thank you very much, uh, Alia. Um, we are hearing from the Taliban from time to time, claiming that they have changed. They are not the Taliban of the 90s in Afghanistan, uh, that they have uh, um, changed a lot and they are going to, if in case if they are a part of the government or they lead the government or anyway they think uh, freedom of speech will be guaranteed and for women uh, rights will be given according to islamic values i'd like to ask um, Shahrzad, what do you think about these claims um, do you think really the taliban have changed and how do you see uh, freedom of speech in the freedom of uh, women in afghanistan in a possible post peace deal afghanistan thank you mid john I just want to mention that uh, in December, following our meeting with the journalists, we made a statement and um, made specific recommendations to the government and international community the, uh, and, and, and also Taliban and government. The focus was a lot on protection, and also investigation, and prosecution, as Alia has also raised in lot for law. For Taliban, we also we asked, um, uh, we had a recommendations. We had a, we, we we made a point about the fact that denials don't absolve them of responsibility. Um, and also that they need to be, um, they need to be instruct, they need to instruct um, um, their fighters um, and affiliates to not use a, a poisonous rhetoric um, uh, about journalists. This was because it was brought to our attention that um, one of the media affiliated with the Taliban at the provincial level um, was broadcasting basically Taliban version of songs um, saying that journalists, independent media are uh, slaves of infidels and, and, and extra, extra that would put journalists at risk directly. Um, following this, um, 
uh, the Taliban did put out a statement about the fact that they are not targeting journalists and the um, independent journalists. However, of course, uh, clearly more needs to be done as uh, we see, unfortunately, the continued targeting of journalists. The first day of 21, uh, 2021, we had a journalist killed um, in Afghanistan, unfortunately. So um, the first journalist killed in 2021 was, uh, uh, was an Afghan journalist and then civil society activists, prosecutors, judges have continuously been targeted. Um, have Taliban changed? I mean, it depends on what you look at. I think it's important to look at Taliban controlled areas and the lived experience of people in those areas. We don't have direct access to those areas because we are concerned about the security of our colleagues. We have raised with Taliban several times access to these areas, to documents, human rights uh, violations, um, including claims of civilian casualties that are sometimes made. Um, we, have very we have a lot of difficulty documenting claims of civilian casualties um, from Taliban controlled areas because it's hard to access um, the actual site of the incident. However, we haven't had a positive response on this. I think one thing is clear when it comes to media and journalists, we don't have an independent civil society or independent media in Taliban controlled areas. So this does tell us something about what they practice. We know what they are preaching, but in terms of their practice, this is the, this is the reality on the ground. What will this mean for the future? Um, hard to tell. I think a, a lot of what will come out from the peace process will really depend uh, on how inclusive the process is. If the process is truly inclusive, um, it will have to recognize the new realities of Afghanistan. Uh, an important aspect of that reality is independent of media and this change in mentality where people feel like they should and they can help hold their government and political leaders to account. However, if the process is a process where the voices are silenced and not included, then it's hard to um, anticipate a good outcome. Uh, thank you, Shahzad John. Um, before we go to Lutful Oz for her last question, I would like to ask uh, Shabnam John, Shabnam Nasimi, Executive, Executive Director of uh, Conservative Friends of Afghanistan, in a wider international, um, in, in a wider, ang wider angle, how do you see the international community listening to these voices of Afghanistan? How are they open, um, for example, to your advocacy of Afghanistan's gains that had in the last 20 uh, years or so? Thank you, Ahmed. Um, unfortunately, in, in recent, uh, the last year or so, recent months, um, it has been quite difficult to work with the international community and ensure that they have more active and inclusive involvement. There's a There's been a new report by the House of Lords that was released um, about a month ago uh, on UK-Afghanistan relations. And one of the main recommendations that we made uh, was that um, the UK specifically needs to have um, an independent voice and not simply follow US lead. And that is what's happening at the moment. M much of the international community um, have failed to have a more active and present voice outside of, of the United States policy on Afghanistan. Um, and the reality is, unfortunately, is that the image of Afghanistan's future uh, either for the Afghan people or the international community is not something they've pictured 20 years ago. Um, and this is something that people find uh, quite hesitant, in my opinion, to say, but the Taliban have been directly responsible for these recent attacks. And I think it's incredibly important that we need to call it out openly and to hold them to account. Um, the people of Afghanistan do not deserve this and should not have to suffer. And it is our responsibility to ensure that we, we, very vocally hold them into account. We can pinpoint who who it is, um, and th these peace talks. I mean, if, if the if the Taliban are not ready to be held accountable, um, and if their actions uh, continue to persist, you know, really we, the question that needs to be asked is: Do they truly want peace in Afghanistan, um, or are they simply waiting for the, the world to leave, uh, particularly the United States? Um, and so in this instance, um, my, my work and a lot of other activists outside of Afghanistan, it, it, it's very tricky. Um, it takes a lot of persistence, a lot of time, but it is worth uh, the fight. Afghan lives matter, uh, as a lot of people now say. Uh, and we need to be, um, we need to ensure that we're not silenced, that, that, the, that the 
daily attacks do not desensitize desensitize the world um, to realizing that um, this is not normal, this should not be happening, um, and that the world um, should not completely forget about the reality of Afghanistan. That after 20 years, you know, the war has not ended at all, even though the international community's uh, attention has uh, in that uh, has deteriorated from that direction. So um, it is difficult, but it's worth it. And we need to be able to continuously activate for change in Afghanistan and not to allow for any peace agreement or peace deal to, to um, sacrifice the gains that have been made. Uh, thank you very much, Shamnam. Rufala, last question to you. Um, how do you see the future of media in Afghanistan? Earlier, um, Shahzad John noticed and said that some journalists talked about self-censorship. How do you see future of Afghan media in a post uh, peace deal Afghanistan probably? Uh, and, and, and how do you see just probably this is the not last two last questions I would say. How do you see the role of uh, regional powers in this peace talks in Afghanistan? Two questions please. Thank you. I think I should probably just stick to the media one because the regional is very complicated. No, I'll, I'll, I'll try to address that as well. I, well, when we talk about peace, then we should be happy. Peace means opportunity. Peace, peace means, uh, you know, growth, uh, access to more places. So I'm very happy that once peace comes to Afghanistan, we should be able to go to places that we can. Sorry to interrupt. To uh, sorry to interrupt, Lothula. Do you think peace with a group that kills journalists is still hope, hope bringing? I think we should definitely make peace with those people who kill us because um, uh, that is uh, very, very sad and that stops us from, from what we do. Uh, you know that most of the media reporting in Afghanistan is focused on politics, security and, uh, and war. Uh, and uh, with peace, I think we should be able to talk about healthcare, we should be able to talk about environment. Uh, we should learn how to report on those, on those issues to be very honest with you. So, so I see, I see uh, post-peace Afghanistan or post-peace settlement um, uh, as, as, a, as a new window of opportunity for all of us. How to make it happen, to link it to your other question, regions play a very, very important role. I think uh, we isolated the region 20, 20, 21 years ago. Um, uh, and uh, we are unfortunately not in a situation right now where regional consensus is shaped around the Afghan peace. So uh, uh, it's definitely the responsibility of key stakeholders, uh, the US, the Afghan government, uh, in particular, these two, to work on a broader regional consensus. We hear about Moscow format, we hear about uh, Iran's uh, six plus one format, we hear about uh, India being dismissive of the whole thing. Um, uh, we hear about um, uh, you know, Central Asians uh, trying to play a role. Um, there isn't really uh, a uh, synchronization um, between uh, all these efforts. And uh, there isn't much coming out of Pakistan as well. I think the conversations have been really at the US-Pakistan level. Um, so the, the Kabul-Islamabad level has been very, very um, um, blurry at this stage. So, um, so regional powers are important. We live with them. Uh, I think uh, we, ha we have a conflict in Afghanistan, partly because of conflicting regional interests. Uh, that needs to be addressed if we are into uh, one. Somebody told me uh, a couple of months ago that for once we should think about fixing Afghanistan, not managing Afghanistan. I think the peace process should not be about uh, just transitioning into another chapter. I think it has to be addressing root causes of conflict which, which is not just uh, talking to the Taliban. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rutfla, and all other uh, um, members of the, of, of the panel. Uh, we have Lord uh, Tariq Ahmad of Wimbledon, United Kim Kingdom's Minister uh, for, of, of State uh, for South Asia and Commonwealth. We have Rutfla Najafi Zada, head of Tolo News. Uh, uh, Alia Iftikhar, coordinator and senior researcher at Asia Program Committee to Protect Journalists, and Shabnam Masimi, Execu executive director of Conservative Friends of Afghanistan. My name is Omid Marzban. Thank you very much for um, being with us in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank you. Yes. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.